Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to day two of a Bot Stever Institute for Wildlife Fertility Control webinar series on mitigating wild boar conflict around the world and the potential for using fertility control. I'm Monique Principe and I'm the Institute's Managing Director. Uh, we have an exciting agenda of presentations today and I would like to thank all of our presenters who agreed to participate and to all of our attendees today. Uh, similar to last week's webinar, webinar, we had over 100 web registrants uh, for this event and a similar number for next week's concluding event. So we look forward to hearing your questions during a question and answer period at the end of each session. The first one will be in about 40 minutes or so. And please feel free to type in your questions into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen at any point. And um, Stephanie um, is our Institute's Director for Science and Policy, and I'll hand it over to her at this point. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Monique. Uh, hello, everyone. As Monique said, uh, I'm Stephanie Boyles Griffin, and I serve as the Institute's Science and Policy Director. So to recap, for those that may have missed the first two sessions last week and may not have had a chance to watch them, for years, fertility control has been proposed as a potential method for managing conflicts with wild boar. And given the well-established prolific fecundity of these animals and the fact that they're a management challenge on every continent in the world except maybe Antarctica, it's easy to understand why. For these reasons, we decided to organize this webinar series to provide professionals working in the field of wild boar conflict mitigation with the opportunity to learn about the scale and scope of conflicts globally, uh, site-specific and population management methods that are currently being used to address these conflicts, and then highlight some of the important work that's being done to develop and evaluate the potential for incorporating fertility control methods into these existing management programs. So the webinar series has been organized so that each session will build upon information presented in the previous session, so as I said last week, if you missed last week's sessions or are, are unable to attend both sessions today, we highly recommend taking some time to view any sessions that you've missed prior to participating in future sessions. We will make those recorded sessions available to all registrants so you can watch them uh, if you wish or catch up before participating in the next one. So with that, I will hand it back over to Monique. Thanks, Stephanie. So um, we have um, many presenters to get to, so I don't want to take up a lot of time. Our first session is titled Modeling and Population Surveying. And let's proceed to our first presenter, Kim Pepin. Uh, Kim, if you want to come on to screen and unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Terrific. Hello. Um, Dr. Pepin is a quantitative ecologist at the National Wildlife Research Center at the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture in, um, in the, here in the United States, where she develops analytical tools for assisting the evaluation and implementation of wildlife damage and disease management programs, including feral swine. Dr. Pepin received a PhD in zoology from University of Idaho. Uh, and a BS in uh, ecology from the University of British Columbia. She also completed postdoctoral research in quantitative disease ecology at New Mexico State University, Penn State University, and Fogarty International Center at National Institute of Health, where she developed modeling tools for risk assessment and control of disease in wildlife populations. Uh, with that, I will go off screen and I will hand it over to you, Kim. If you'd like to share your presentation. Hopefully Thank everyone you. can see that. Yes, um, we can yeah. see it. Great, okay, I'll get started then. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about some modeling work that um, looks to evaluate the potential effects of fertility control and management of feral swine focusing on the USA. Um, let's see here, if I can figure out how to switch slides. 
There we go. Um, so I'm going to go over briefly first the lethal tools that we use for managing damage and then at the effects of them on populations to help give more context for how fertility control could fit into this picture. So um, we use a variety of different tools across the nation. Um, these different bubbles are showing the number of feral swine removed by state uh, using different tools. And so one thing to note is the difference of, of colors of these pies highlights that, for example, in Texas here, you'll see a lot of aerial, um, the proportion of removal is through aerial gunning work, whereas in Florida here, um, most of it is with trapping. And that's because um, different tools have different effectiveness depending on the environment. So for example, this, this plot here is showing you like, oh, in open arid areas, aerial gunning might be more effective. Um, and you can get a higher removal rate with aerial gunning relative to these real vegetative areas. Um, and then these tools also vary in effectiveness over the course of the year. So um, these plots here are showing you like for aerial gunning, for example, um, the highest take per unit effort is going to be um, in, in the winter months when there's not a lot of vegetation. Where, uh, and, you know, and these are just showing some seasonal trends for like sharpshooting versus trapping. So the take home here just being that different tools are also going to be more effective at different times of the year. And then um, these are some patterns in terms of um, the trends in removal on different properties with how work is being conducted. So the bubbles correspond to the numbers of animals removed, um, bigger being more numbers of animals removed. And you can see that with some tools, like this looks like more of a pattern of aerial gunning on this property where um, you know, the folks are coming in and removing a large number and then not coming back for periods of time. Um, and then this is more of a pattern of trapping where there's more consistent removal of a fewer number of animals. And those, these kinds of differences in patterns. So one question we had is how, how might these patterns or this frequency of removal impact populations? And so you can see here, what we found is, um, you know, this pattern of being more consistent, it's just there are fewer animals removed over time. And so a much slower uh, decline in the population because there's more opportunity for births to keep happening. There's not large decreases in the population. Whereas with aerial gunning, where you're able to remove a large number and really reduce that population, you end up with elimination over a shorter time frame. Now, those uh, plots I just showed you were for an example of applying these methods to a closed population. But oftentimes what we have in, in continental USA is, um, you know, we're, we're targeting our control to one area and it might be an area that's completely surrounded by other feral swine that can move in as we're doing control. And so when you look at these same patterns, when you have all this immigration happening, uh, you can see that maybe it's not a high enough culling rate to actually really reduce the population. Um, but you still see that when you do large numbers, you can bump the population down and hold it down for a while. Um, in, in here, uh, culling actually stopped. And so the population rebounds through this immigration effect. So another feature you might focus on to try and make these uh, culling, culling strategies more effective is to focus on the birth rate patterns. And so there, some theory in ecology has pointed out that if you focus on all your removal time in birth pulse species at the time when births have happened, then you your removal might be cons compensatory. You're just sort of removing those extra animals that happened through the birth pulse. Whereas if you can focus your removals in times where the pop the abundance is lowest right before the birth pulse, then you might actually make a, a difference in or more of a difference in reducing the abundance. And um, if you do some simulations you can test this theory and see how you might lead to faster elimination that way. However, 
uh, feral swine aren't a real birth pole species because they have a lot of genes mixed in with domestic swine. And so they have births throughout the year, although there are times, there are trends of patterns of higher births. So we wanted to look into whether this theory was also applicable to um, feral swine. And another feature is how you remove feral swine in space. So you might target uh, you might be re removing them in a spatially random way, or how is typically done is targeting sounders, so targeting areas on the, of the landscape where there are more feral swine. Uh, and, and then another strategy might be zoning. So maybe you target one space and you keep uh, resources in place so that you actually do elimination in that space and sort of eliminate across the landscape. And what we found by, by looking at these two features, timing and spatial uh, strategies, is that the zoning effect def was much more efficient than using a spatially random approach, which is not typically used, but like targeting sounders is. So targeting just high density patches. Um, and then the other feature, so looking in the blue here, this is targeting the low birthing times. And you could target that through the targeting the lowest birthing month only, which is what you might do in a birth pole species or through targeting the low birthing period. And um, you can see that in, in this case here, targeting the, low, the lowest birthing month only and focusing all your resources during that time so that you actually remove a larger number in a very short period of time is the best strategy. Um, this is just sort of repeating that. So more efficient in, in target to target the low birthing periods, zoning's more efficient and focusing all resources in a short time window. And the reason for that is because if you can remove a large number in a short time window, that gives the pop you are able to decrease the population to a lower abundance and then it takes much longer to get back up to this real high productive um, carrying capacity if you want to think about it that way. So now looking given this context, how might uh, fertility control fit into this. So we looked at this by setting up the situation. These were our assumptions. So thinking about a gonicon like product. Um, and using, uh, using the fertility control alongside lethal control, because in our case, we're trying to manage damage and lethal control is the fastest way to manage damage. Um, and so our program doesn't ever think about not um, managing with lethal control. Um, uh, and so we wanted to look at it alongside lethal control. And also um, feral swine are an invasive species in the US. Uh, so the next thing is uh, this product is used to sterilize females. Um, and we assume that those females wouldn't be distinguished. So they could be called by this other lethal control that's happening. And then uh, the sterilant can be broadcast generally across the landscape. So we were thinking of something like oral baiting for the distribution. And this product doesn't exist. So this is kind of imaginary and looking into a hypothetical situation. Um, and it would sterilize females. The effects would last two years. Um, and we looked at being able to sterilize between 20 and 80% of females each year. Um, and we assumed that gestating females would still be able to give birth uh, to the current litter before becoming sterilized. Um, and that each sample is a proportion at random. So we can include the already sterilized females. So basically, um, you know, if in the prior year you already had some females sterilized, then in the next year, this broadly applicable baiting would may sample some of those females that were already sterilized and it would extend their time of being sterilized. And so just to orient you in the results here. So we looked at three different intrinsic population growth rates. I'm showing 30%, 80%, and 140%. And I'd like to point out that 140% has never been documented in the US. This is like extremely high. 
Um, 30% is what has been most reported, but 80% has also, you know, up to 80% has also been reported. So I think these are more in the realistic range um, for birth rates, intrinsic birth rates. And then we looked at the effects of, um, as I mentioned, the sterilization for, you know, distributing it for reaching 20% of females, 40% of females, 60% of females, 80%. And in these different conditions of culling, so here, this is like the annual rate of increase over four years from births minus culling. So that's sort of the condition in the population. Um, so that gives you the orientation of these numbers. And you can see broadly that, you know, when you have this real high birth rate, you can see some abundance reduction, pretty high abundance reduction with um, real high levels of the sterilin. Um, but basically, there's a pretty narrow range of net population growth rates where the fertility control is beneficial. So here, culling is being less effective and not leading to very large population declines. And that's where you start to see the sterilant being beneficial. Um, and then also it requires substantial rates of uh, the distribution of the sterilant. And as I mentioned, in real high birth rate populations. And then that was in a closed population, which is not the typical condition. Typically, we have immigration happening. So how does the sterilant perform in the presence of immigration? Um, we saw the opposite effect here that with immigration, it's, it's most helpful in the populations with the lowest intrinsic birth rates and you can get gains. So here you can see that with births plus immigration minus culling, the population is not uh, declining all that strongly. And so you can get added benefits of up to 13 or 18% with adding fertility control if you're able to distribute it to a very high percent of the population. And then, um, so it, it provides some small benefit when the culling rates are high. So here the culling rates are actually really high, um, but the net population growth rate is low. And so that's where you're seeing the benefit. Um, and as I mentioned, but it requires high population coverage. So just to summarize the implications, lethal methods could be more efficient by optimizing the timing, frequency, and spatial strategies of removal when there's flexibility. But when there's flexibility is an important point because um, oftentimes there can be constraints um, in terms of the management resources and how they're placed across the landscape. And then also with cooperators, we can't always plan at a broad landscape scale um, for the timing and frequency and spatial strategies. Um, it requires, um, you know, being in line with cooperator schedules and um, their constraints. And then um, Without immigration, we saw fertility controls beneficial when culling rates are lower than population growth rates. So it's important to understand what the net population growth rate is with all of the management strategies before we can evaluate uh, the benefit from fertility control. And then with immigration, we saw that fertility control is potentially useful alongside culling when immigration is so high that effects of culling are swamped. Um, but high coverage is needed to achieve this. And basically the concept here is, um, has been called the placeholder effect. So let's say you can uh, have, you have this high rate of immigration, you know, sounders moving into this area that you're trying to manage and what fertility control could add could be to keep the pre-existing sounders in there reproducing at lower rates so that other sounders aren't moving in and um, ramping up the immigration rates. Um, but just some food for thought. Um, our main objective here is to manage damage. And if we want to minimize or eliminate damage, then we want to minimize or eliminate feral swine. So what we really want to understand that isn't well understood yet is what abundant, how, how the, what's the relationship between a decrease in abundance and a decrease in damage 
you know, like if you reduce the population by 70%, is that like a 32% reduction in damage or a 70% reduction in damage or a 91% reduction in damage? So um, I think some next steps to evaluate whether fertility control could be helpful, given that we've seen that you need to use it in really high frequencies to provide any benefit alongside culling for reducing damage, um, it's gonna be important to look at the cost effectiveness of doing that. Um, and that's, uh, I just wanna acknowledge my collaborators, um, Amy Davis, Doug Eckery, Kurt Bricotteran, and Fred Cunningham in this work. And uh, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Kim. Um, our next speaker is Simon Croft. Simon uh, is a quantitative ecologist in the Department of Epidemiological Animal, Plant, and Health Agency in the United Kingdom. Simon is an applied mathematician interested in developing data-driven models to explore complex biological systems. His main focus is addressing issues related to animal health and management and providing evidence to inform policy decision-making. Uh, Simon? Hi, yep, yeah, yeah, thank you. I will try and share my screen now. Hopefully, fingers crossed this works. Okay, uh, just because I can't see Zoom anymore, can I just confirm that that's working? That's fine, we see it. Yes, we yeah, see it. Excellent. Okay, um, so the talk I'm going to give today is on a piece of work um, that we've recently uh, published. And it's um, work that we were um, aiming to develop a model um, to look at wild boar population dynamics, um, particularly on a, a closed population, which I'll, I'll explain the reasons for that in a moment. Um, and aiming to use a largely data-driven approach in order to um, parameterize that model and then go on to use that to look at um, the impacts of um, different regimes of culling and fertility control um, with looking at the, um, the different intensities and the, the, relevant, the corresponding time that would then take to control the population to a certain level um, using culling, fertility control, or, or a combination of both. Um, so um, thanks to one of, uh, to my collaborator, Dr. Barbara uh, Franzetti, I think he is talking in the next session. Um, we were able to obtain um, data from a long-term wild boar study site um, in Castel Porciano um, Natural Preserve, uh, Nature Preserve um, near Rome, um, which is a, a site approximately um, 60 kilometer, square kilometers in size. Um, and um, ha has um, a fenced population of, contains a fenced population of wild boar, um, uniquely um, having um, no sport hunting and the graph, uh, the plot on the right hand side there compares the two. One using um, capture mark recapture, um, which was uh, conducted in uh, summer, um, which is um, uh, pre-removals. And then um, one using uh, nocturnal uh, distance sampling, um, which conducted in, in autumn after some um, captures. But the, so comparing the two different um, Two different approaches, but adding back in the uh, summer removals to the to the distance sampling actually showed that um, both population estimates roughly provided similar and uh, similar estimates for population. Um, and then but we also used um, demographic structures, which we estimated from summer count data at uh, feeding stations. So um, numbers for females, males, and for piglets. For each one of those different um, demographic groups, um, we had corresponding removals data, which um, 
is from um, trap removals, but also from um, winter shooting as well. And um, the data set we were working with um, was from 2001 to uh, 2018. So this is the technical bit. Um, I don't really want to spend too much time in, or, or scare anybody with the, with the maths. Really the most important things um, that I want to say is um, just, to, just to highlight, that as, as I've said, we have three different um, cohorts, three different uh, demographic groups within our population that we consider. So we have non-breeding juveniles or piglets, which are uh, less than a year old, um, and then sexually mature adults and females um, over, over a year old. Um, in, in our model, obviously only females can breed. Um, and we consider a um, density dependent um, fecundity rate, which is the, uh, the, the equation there, FT. Um, we do also consider a stochastic variation or a stochastic noise in our model and try and um, represent that using a multivariate normal. So essentially what this is doing, our, our basic model is deterministic. Um, so it doesn't contain any, any um, variation at all. And the stochastic component is um, absorbing bits of the model that we, the deterministic model does not capture. So potential, potentially uh, some uh, survey errors or survey, um, uh, yeah, survey errors. And, um, and also uh, things like environmental um, variation. Um, so last thing to say is that I mentioned we used the data-driven approach um, so our parameterization and prediction, we used a, a Bayesian fitting approach in order to, um, to determine our parameter values. So this is the, the first result really. Um, so these are the estimates that the, the model um, predicted, our approach predicted. What, what's quite interesting here is that um, we noted that it, it showed very high survival rates for, for adults um, for um, and one of the benefits of the method that we're using here is because we are able to um, actually account for and remove the effects of uh, hunting because we have the numbers, then actually we're able to see the potential um, estimates for the natural survival of, of the animals, which um, these estimates are generally higher than those that are found in the literature because this is quite a unique situation that we're able to do this. Um, the other thing I would draw your attention to on this slide is looking at the error. What's interesting here is that the, um, the error for juveniles, we noticed, was substantially higher than that of adults. And um, I suggestion that our conclusion was that this is due to the environmental variation and the impact of that on um, particularly juveniles. So, for instance, in poor conditions, it's, it's likely to be the juveniles that are affected most. So this is just our uh, graphs of our model fit. So um, you can see how, um, how well our model is matching the data with those, um, those estimates. Okay, so this is the more interesting bit. <laughs> so um, this is starting, this is our initial result, starting to look at different combinations of culling and sterilization. Um, I won't spend too much, too much time with this um, quite, um, detailed looking graph, I've, I've prepared a summary. What we're, um, what we're most interested in is the top dotted line, which shows our 97.5% credible uh, interval, which is similar to um, a traditional confidence interval. Um, and so looking at that in particular um, and how it relates to um, our growth rate and uh, our, our ability to reach uh, a target, which we set at 400, a population of 400 boar. Um, <clears throat> you can hopefully see, uh, this, this, is, this is a summary of it. So um, the red squares uh, are where um, that credible interval is um, not, show, not uh, showing a reduction in boar. So we're actually getting uh, population growth, which would suggest that the control methods aren't able to, um, are, are never going to be able to reach our target. Um, our amber um, squares are where um, the population, we are getting population reduction or we do see population reduction, um, but that is not uh, rapid enough to provide, to reach our target within 20 years. And then the green um, is showing where actually we're able to achieve our target population um, within our 20 year simulation period, 
and the numbers relate to uh, how many years it took uh, to reach that target. Um, so the interest here is looking at 60% culling, for instance. If we um, if we start with um, that situation, but using no, having applying no um, fertility control at all, then our models suggest that it might it would take 18 years um, from the current population of about 3,000 boar um, to reach a, a target population of um, 400. Um, but um, with the addition of 20% uh, and then subsequently 40% sterilization up to 80%, we actually um, see some substantial reductions in the, um, the time to reach that target. So actually, if we were um, looking at the, um, the most intense situation with 80% uh, fertility control, 80% contraception um, of bore, then actually we could reduce our time taken to reach our target by um, more than three times which is really encouraging. Um, using our model then, um, which is parameterized um, for Castel Porziano, we looked at a second site in, uh, in England, the Forest of Dean, um, where we have a similar situation. So the population here is not fenced, but it is isolated. So um, uh, with, with relatively minimal um, immigration, emigration, sorry, and um, no, no immigration. Uh, the conditions were roughly similar, so we felt it was it was plausible for us to be able to use a similar uh, carrying capacity, similar density um, uh, density dependence uh, for this site. The major difference is that, um, and, and this is perhaps um, true of, of other um, closed populations around the world, is that there is additional mortality for these boar um, due to uh, more human um, more human interaction, so in this case, due to road traffic collisions. So again, we applied the same uh, the same model um, and looked at the same situation, um, but with the additional 10% um, mortality. What's interesting here, and you might, um, if it's possible, if, you, if your memory is good enough to compare to the previous slide, actually we see very little difference in the um, in the combinations of culling and sterilization that work in this scenario uh, compared to Castor Porziano. So it's, it's a very similar outcome. Um, the major difference is that where we see successes, the um, time to, uh, to control the population is, is less. Um, that is also down to the uh, lower, uh, slightly lower starting population as well. But similarly, um, if we look at the 60% culling um, situation again, um, even with 40% sterilization here, we're at what the model is suggesting is that it's possible to halve the time to, um, to reach the target population with the addition of fertility control alongside culling. So just to sum up our conclusions here, so um, looking across our two situations, fertility control alone um, did not appear sufficient to, to reduce wild boar numbers. Um, at least in the uh, with 97.5% confidence that we were looking at. Um, although there were some, it's worth saying that there were some scenarios in which um, reductions were seen, but this wasn't on a consistent basis. Um, but when we added fertility control to culling, um, we did see that there was significant benefits um, of this regime um, making culling, uh, showing um, a faster time to to achieve our target population um, than culling alone. Um, and obviously, assume, assuming that um, fertility control then is um, can be applied more cost effectively than culling, um, these methods uh, should simultaneously could simultaneously be applied to rapidly decrease numbers in a, in a closed population. Um, so in terms of future work, um, so that last point is something that we would like to look at further. So um, looking at um, building in estimates of costs um, to work out the best, the optimal strategy um, in terms of cost effectiveness versus uh, looking at uh, culling um, and then fertility control uh, of with oral and injectable contraceptives. And um, I think Kim um, touched on this as well, um, is um, looking at um, the cost effectiveness of maintenance as well once um, once desired targets are reached. So this is um, the 
looking instead at maintaining low populations rather than necessarily um, uh, causing population reduction. Okay, so just a few acknowledgements there, and um, that's that's the end from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, okay, we'll keep moving with our next presenter. Um, our next speaker is Ulf Holman. Ulf, if you want to come on to screen, perfect. Um, studying at the University of Tübingen and University of Kiel, Kyle, forgive my German. Ulf Holman uh, completed his diploma of biology in 1992 after the submission of his dissertation at the Forestal Faculty of the University of Göttingen in 1998. He was the chairperson of the Society for Wildlife Ecology and Conservation. In this role, he appeared in the media as an expert for the increasing urbanization of animals. And he currently works for the Research Institute for Forest Ecology and Forestry, Rhineland Palatinate in Germany. And it's all yours, Ulf. Thank you, Monique. OK, I will give you uh, some uh, information about uh, two cases we studied in Germany. So we can go on to the next slide, please. So you saw that slide in the first session. Uh, Giovanna showed us that the harvest rates in Europe um, normally go uh, positive. So it's an increasing almost everywhere, but uh, next slide, please. If we uh, look on, on Germany uh, in more precise, pre more precisely, next please, which is located here in the very center. Next. Okay, we studied these two forests here, um, the Sarkolewald and the Palatinate Forest, both were located quite close to the French border. The next slide give you, gives you an idea how it looks like. They're really uh, closed forests. So that's not, uh, the common situation in Germany. It's more open in Germany, like in, in the rest of Europe. So it's an exceptional situation. And what uh, makes us very interested in these areas is the next slide that we saw the harvest rates here over a period of some years uh, is not uh, having the same development like in the rest of Germany, which will you see in the next year. So the, all over Germany, we have more or less an increasing pattern of the harvest rate, but in the Sarkolewald and in the central Palatinate forest, both study areas uh, are encompassing um, some thousands of hectares. The harvest rates go, go down. Some, sometimes they go up again and then they go down. So it looks like a bit different and we were interested why. Okay, next slide. So the question was why wild boar harvest goes down against the main trend in, in Germany? How could that be? Here are some um, of the publications uh, referring to this study. Um, you can, uh, yeah, I think you will get this, um, this uh, presentation later on so you can figure out the publications. Okay, we, we were looking on harvest data for sure on one side and on the other side, next slide please. Um, yeah, okay, the, the approach was comparing the population density with harvest rates. That is quite simple approach but how we did it. Next please. So um, we sampled feces in spring along transects, mostly in a period of two weeks. Then we genotyped the feces to get the individuals and we modeled the population size, including the sex ratio based on these genotyping patterns with a capture mark recapture approach. And uh, for sure, on the other hand, we collected harvest data in the same areas. If you want to have a more detailed um, impression of what we did from the modeling point of view, I can recommend a quite recent publication listed down here. Um, it's on Red Deer, but the approach is pretty much the same. Um, okay, next slide, please. 
So this is now the Sarkolewald, the map of the Sarkolewald. You see it's a suburban area. You see the settlements in red and uh, the forest area is green. And the blue area is the forest area where we uh, made this study. It's um, surrounded by highways, the yellow lines, and these highways are fenced. So it's interestingly, it's more or less a closed population within this suburban area. That's quite interesting for us from the modeling point of view because we don't have any uh, really um, severe uh, edge effects here. And these black lines, these were the transects we walked with students um, looking for uh, skets on the ground. And the next slide shows you the, the pattern of the distribution pattern of the, the feces we found from the wild boar. Approximately 5,000 5, feces were found. Not all of them were genotyped, but that was the rough data in the field. Next slide. And we, we come to the results. I will skip the, the theoretic part and the error bars. I just wanted to point out um, one very simple message here. Um, this is the data, for example, for 2008 in the Palatinate Forest. It shows you the population density we modeled by this genotyping approach in individual per 100 hectares or one square kilometer. And uh, the red column is the female density and the blue column is the male density. That's one very neat and uh, nice thing with this uh, genotyping approach because you get a very good sex ratio. And uh, you see the sex ratio is a little bit biased towards the females, so the red column is a bit larger than the blue one. And together we have a density of five animals per square kilometer, which is much, much low be, uh, below the densities uh, from the forest of Dean or Castel Porziano, Simon um, showed us before. Um, okay, so that is the spring density. And if we now include the potential reproduction. We didn't manage the, we didn't measure the reproduction, uh, but uh, if we just assume four piglets per female, it could be something around the, of the yellow or orange bar here. And both together will, get, will be the summer population if you add both columns. And now we look on the hunting and you see that the hunting is with three animals per square kilometer much below uh, this um, the whole summer population that was quite interesting to see um, and it's interesting even if you consider that this harvest trade is one of the largest ever being taken in that forest okay and now we look at the data from the palatinate forest uh, from, from the sarkolaval the other area we did it twice in 2013 and 2017. you see the population density is a bit higher uh, it's almost two three times higher the sex ratio is again biased towards females it's even more biased towards females so the potential output the reproductive output is even larger and the harvest rates are again much lower um, than the summer population. If we skip the estimate of reproduction, because we didn't measure it really, next slide. And we just look on the female spring population and what the harvest was taking, we can conclude that in all these cases, the harvest does not exceed female population. So the next conclusion is quite clear. Uh, next please, that the harvest may take, may take 30% of the summer population. So, and, and if you remember what Simon said, that with 30, 40% culling rate, you will not get uh, the population down. Um, yeah, this is exactly what we assume here as well, that 30% is not very effective. But keep in mind that both in both areas, it was the aim of the management of the wild boar management of the hunting to get the populations down. That was what they wanted. Okay, next. So to summarize and conclude, the harvest in these two forest study areas varies, but with a longer negative trend that was in contrast to the trend in all over Germany. Harvest 
must take approximately 60, 70% of the population each year for regulation which has, to my knowledge, and I think it's the same conclusion um, from the literature review done by the European Food and Safety Authority, um, the link is shown below, uh, never found so far on large areas in Europe. And this fits quite well to that what Simon said with these 60 or 80% of culling rate, he took the numbers down. Based on these genetic population estimates, um, and the reproductive potential, um, this study area takes only 30%. Though it's quite clear that hunting here is not very effective. So something, something else must regulate those populations in these unusual forested areas. And um, yeah, once again, we, we, can, we, we are pretty sure that this is the forest that limits the population, the food supply in those forests. In agricultural areas, um, the, the carrying capacity will be, okay, that's anything else, but not hunting is regulating here. Probably it's the food. And in agricultural areas, carrying capacity will be much higher and more constant at least. So the hunting is maybe even less effective in those areas. Thank you. Next slide. Yes, that's important. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Oh, I'm muted or no? Can you all hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Okay. So thank you all. We're going to start the Q&A for this session now. So if you have not submitted your questions on the Q&A um, uh, option on your screen, please, um, please start doing so. We've got one uh, question so far for Simon. So Simon, if you wanna join us. Hi. Well, okay, I, can you hear you? I've seen, yeah, uh, I've seen the question. I was, um, I've just, I was just in the process of messaging Barbara actually because I wondered if um, she might be able, in a better position, to answer that particular question than me. Oh, okay. Um, is she on? Do you, or, so you already see the question. It's and I'll, I'll, I'll tell, say to everyone that may not uh, see it on their screen. So it's how many animals were involved in the in the CRM? I'm um, sorry, CMR. So sorry, I, I I mean off the top of my head, I, I don't know I don't know the answer. Like I said I don't know. Okay. Love is just unmuted, so she'll be able to provide me with some more information. Thank you. Hi, um, hi to everybody. I'm Barbara. <laughs> As uh, I have um, answered to the question, uh, more than two thousand and seven hundred wild boars were. Capture, mark, and release between 1995 and 2019. Okay. And then the precise number is, uh, is that, yep, this one, sorry. Okay. 2,572 wild boar. Okay. And then another question for Simon, but Barbara, stand by just in case. Uh, Simon, how do you plan to calculate the costs of culling wild boar in England? Yeah, so this isn't something that necessarily we've, we've started looking at in too much detail at the moment, but um, the majority of, of culling, um, as far as I'm aware, so that there is, um, private hunting that goes on um, in the UK. Um, but in terms of um, culling, a lot of that is conducted by one of our um, uh, government agencies. So um, we have links um, there that we're able to talk to about the amount of time um, that goes into um, those culls, um, the numbers of animals that are, are obviously removed and trying to look at um, costing it up that way. So. Um, basically liaising with the different ranges and the different um, people that are involved to try and work out the amount of time it's taking and, and costing it from there, essentially. 
like I say, it's not a piece of work that we've necessarily started, so I don't have a definitive answer to that. But obviously, um, I'm happy if there's a mechanism to do so. I'm happy to keep people updated um, as that work progresses. Okay. Okay. Um, and the next question, and this is for any of our uh, previous uh, presenters that would like to address it. Um, do any of the presenters have insight into behavioral changes that occur or are likely to occur after fertility control? For example, change in home ranges, differences in patterns of crop damage. Those are just a couple of examples that the, uh... anyone? No? Uh, Stephanie? <laughs> yeah, Gio. Hi, everybody. Hello. Uh, it's Giovanna here. Uh, yes, we did a small study. It, we were meant to do it to make it bigger, but the a number of our animals ended up shot dead. But we didn't see any difference in behavior. We didn't see in, in captivity after treating animals with gonacum. We didn't see any difference in behavior, physiology, welfare, anything we measured between treated and controlled. And in the wild, when several animals ended up dead, the few that survived, again, we didn't see any major difference that made us think uh, it could have been due to fertility control. Okay. So right now we don't have any other questions. So if folks do have questions, please feel free to submit them in the, uh, the question and answer box, um, but try to avoid the chat box because we're not, we're not checking that when we're checking the Q&A. Uh, Stephanie? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know whether Barbara wants to comment on this, but Barbara had uh, shared with us the, the cost of culling while boring Castel Porziano. So she might not have the, the data um, with her, but she might want to comment on this. Uh, oh, well, um, it's quite high indeed. Uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, calculating the cost of uh, um, the corals uh, to capture animals. People need to capture animals. Uh, um, the feed you need to uh, to give uh, uh, to, to, to bait uh, uh, the, the corals, uh, um, guns, uh, um, uh, car to move uh, animals capture from uh, outside the area, um, gasoline, uh, um, I don't know, um, uh, laser range finder uh, to, to culling animals uh, or uh, uh, optics uh, or uh, um, ammunition uh, and so on. I mean, it's uh, quite high. Uh, maybe <laughs> more than quite high. <laughs> I can remember now I have to check uh, on my data. Maybe later I can see it, the, the, the the amount of money needed to do it okay. is quite large, but uh, I mean, it's a, a natural preserve. So it's, uh, it's necessary to protect uh, uh, biodiversity inside the area. So it's worth spending all this money to do it. Right, right. Well, we have about, I'm checking the clock and we have about five more minutes for questions on this session. So, um, there's one that just came in. If anybody else has questions, please submit them. So the next question is, in the prior three presentations, the densities of wild boar are all very, very high compared with what is in China, which is two to five per square kilometer. But we talk about the conflicts. Do you have any suggestion on the threshold of so-called conflict through the tolerance to conflicts and how those are influenced by culture, ethics, and I'm going to speculate values and attitudes?
Does anybody want to, to attempt an answer to that question? Stephanie, I can add something whilst others think about it. Okay. That's okay. Um, I've seen throughout my many years working on these, uh, a number of estimates of wild boar, uh, very few that I believed. I will believe the estimates uh, that Barbara will provide because they have been the, the data have been collected through distance sampling that is a very well known. I think Barbara will talk about it. Uh, there's a very well known method. Mm -hmm. uh, or the density that Ulf is talking about, again, because the, the methods are standard and well tested, and, and all the um, assumptions of the methods are met. But very often I've heard people saying there are two boards, there are three boards, there are 10 pigs per square kilometer. And then when you ask, how do you know, it, it's not necessarily a good answer what comes out. So I think I would be very careful about talking about density without saying how it has been measured. Right. And then I also had, uh, if we have time, I had a uh, uh, maybe an observation for Kim or, or something I would like to share with others, the link between the number of animals, number of wild boar, wild pigs, and, and damage. Mm -hmm. um, I remember an old paper by Jim Hone, Hone that suggested that it's certainly not linear, and after a certain threshold, the, the damage can go up and down irrespective of numbers. So if mm -hmm. anybody wants to comment on this, it would be interesting if we have time. Got about two minutes left before we have to get to our next session. So if anybody else wants to add anything to, um, to Gio's comments, this would be a good time. Um, let me also check to see if we have any other questions that have come in. We, I think we have. Um, so here's one more question if, if nobody else wants to comment. Has anyone looked at the impact of hybridization of wild boar uh, with domestic pigs on fertility control efforts and uh, as well as wild boar and pot belly pig hybrids? Anybody have any experience with the occurrence of hybridization with those two domestic um, animals? Stephanie? Go ahead, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, in Italy, uh, there is a study published mm, two or three years ago, I can't remember, that uh, uh, says that uh, hybridization seems to um, improve uh, um, the, pro the, the, the number of uh, uh, piglets of, uh, per uh, females uh, in, uh, in, uh, in an area uh, in central Italy. Uh, this means that uh, uh, if it's true, uh, if it's really true, uh, it means that uh, uh, the, the, the impact of fertility, co fertility control could be larger because you reduce uh, the number of uh, piglets uh, available for the next year in a, in a uh, much more um, consistent way. I mean, anyway, you can kill the, 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 the sow before piglets uh, born, Perfect. so you remove the problem from the starting point. Right. Kind of alluding to the, some of what Kim was presenting in her, in her presentation as well. Um, we have a, well, there's a, there's a chat comment, but I'm not going to be able to get to it because it is now 12 o'clock, so we're going to have to wrap up this session. Thank you to all of our speakers. I'm going to hand it over to Monique. All right. Yeah, once again, thank you to everyone. And we will start session two, which is titled Tools and Implementation. And our first presenter is Kurt Verkoderen. Uh, Kurt earned a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point and a master and PhD from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. 
He has served as a supervisory research wildlife biologist for the National Wildlife Research Center at the US Department of Agriculture Wildlife Services for over 20 years. The goal of Kurt's research is reducing human wildlife conflicts and diseases of wildlife. Over his career, he has focused primarily on deer, elk, wild pigs, raccoons, bovine tuberculosis, chronic wasting disease, and rabies. His research has taken place across the US and its territories, as well as abroad. He has been an affiliate faculty member at 14 universities and has served on PhD and master's committees. He has published over 200 papers in scientific journals, 27 book chapters, and edited two books. And when not working, he enjoys spending time with his wife and two daughters and hunting anything with hooves and feathers. So, Kurt. Okay, is, I'll share screen, help guide me here. Yep, if you share screen, it should just work well. Make sure you get the right one. Uh, we see it. I think you're good. Okay. Well, th thank you. And thank you for the invite. Um, working at the National Wildlife Research Center, most of my work over the years has been on non-lethal techniques to mitigate damage and, and disease. And then more recently, as I got more involved with the um, feral swine, shifted to working on the development of a, of a toxicant. So um, kind of new to the, the lethal um, aspects of, of the work, but as just from the previous session, it's pretty obvious that it's just how it has to be. We've got to remove some animals uh, from these populations before we can um, uh, reduce the damage to acceptable levels. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the toxicant that the USDA has been developing in, in collaboration with Australian partners and a lot about the bait station that we've developed and other bait stations can be talked about too, because regardless of the pharmaceutical, you know, the agent we want to deliver, if it's a toxicant or a vaccine or a um, chemosterolant, we need to be able to deliver it in a very specific way. So a lot of the information that we're learning in this toxicant adventure will inform our um, fertility control efforts going forward. Um, the primary Partners on, on this effort that I'm going to talk about today have been Nathan Snow, who's with me at the NWRC, and Justin Foster with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And we both have large crews that work together closely um, on this. So first of all, what makes an ideal toxicant for, for wild pigs or anything else? There's some characteristics that we need to, to really try to target. We want it to be species specific. It's got to be effective. It's got to be palatable so that the animals will consume it. Um, we want very minimal secondary risks. We don't want to be harming animals that find these carcasses. Um, same goes for risks to humans. And it's got to be as you know, humane as possible relative to the animals that we are targeting. And if possible, it would be nice if there's an antidote available for it. So why is this so difficult with wild pigs? Well, for a variety of, of reasons. Um, if you're baiting wild pigs, you're also baiting other wildlife that are gonna be um, trying to get it to bait in your bait stations. Here are some pictures of some of the animals that um, we need to try to thwart, raccoons being our main nemesis here, and just the characteristics of pigs themselves, right? Um, as you put something new on the landscape, a new bait, a new bait station, there's a neophobia that you have to get over. You need to do that as quickly as possible. And Pigs are pigs, right? Um, by definition, pigs are messy. So we need to, to worry about any spillage that the pigs might cause that could then be dangerous to non-target wildlife. So currently there are two toxic baits that the public and regulators in the US um, have on their radar. One's a warfarin-based bait, Kaput. It is registered at the federal level, but it's not being used operationally at this point. Um, in any states. Could be in the future, but at this point, it's not. And the other is hog on, which is the one that I'll focus on, a sodium nitrite bait that's being worked through the process right now. Um, we're doing EUP, experimental use permit studies that have been granted to us by the EPA on it um, right, right now. 
And why we focused on sodium nitrite, what we know about sodium nitrite, it's a food preservative, it's a heavy salt, right? So in large doses, it can cause methemoglobinemia. Um, the blood turns kind of a thick, chocolatey brown, um, oxygen is not, not moving, and it, it, it's toxic. At the start of this, the thought was that pigs were especially susceptible, but the more work we do, we realize that that really isn't the case. We need to have a station, a bait station that will protect it from, from other animals so that just pigs are getting at it. Um, one thing we had to overcome was that it tastes really bad. So we ended up micro encapsulating. It took a lot of chemistry to get to this point. And some of what we learned here could also be useful potentially for um, chemosterilins going, going forward. It's highly lethal. It just takes a small handful um, to, to be able to kill a pig. They die in two or three hours. And of course, no death is, is pretty, but this death isn't very ugly. Um, it's, it seems to be um, about as, as quick and pain-free as you could probably expect. And the sodium nitrite, um, when it is exposed to air and water and, and juices and things in the stomach, it's metabolized to sodium nitrate quite quickly, which, which isn't harmful, right? So the, the carcasses um, are safe. Technically, it does have a, an antidote, but we talked amongst ourselves that we don't know how realistic it would be to actually ever get the antidote to an animal in time if, if for example, um, a non-target got a dose. So what have we learned about delivering bait? Um, we'll highlight here the bait station that, that we've worked with our Australian partners to um, manufacture. It's lightweight, it's scalable. You can just add more stations to a site if you got more pigs coming in. We do a lot of monitoring with trail cameras to let us know um, how many pigs are coming into an area. It allows several wild pigs to, to feed at once. And the acclimation and training time is quite quick. The pigs can pick up on this pretty um, quickly. And um, on the front end, it made us nervous that the, all the pigs have to learn how to lift up the lid, but it really only takes one or two because they're like a school of fish. They're together very, very tightly. And all it takes is for one to pop that lid open and then his next, the next ones are in there. So with the tops of their heads and their, and their shoulders, they're holding that base station open for the next one, the next one to get in. So as they're moving around, everybody can get it, can get a turn. And when the lid is shut, and these are closed with, with uh, magnets, um, then it's not available to other non-targets. Now, of course, in North, North America, the only other animal we have to be concerned about would be black bears. And as you can see in the upper right, we are working um, on a box that'll keep them out too. It's, it's a steel box of the same, same design, only it's got a lock on it. So it's always locked unless it, first it has to hear pigs, it has to see pigs. Um, it's not ready to go prime time yet, but we're making good progress on it. And so how do we go about then conditioning the pigs to, to hit them with our toxic bait? We start by just gathering pigs into an area, starting with, with corn. Once they're coming to that corn, we can put our um, bait stations out with the lids propped fully open. We let them feed out of those bait stations for a day or two to get used to that. And of course, we're watching all this through trail cameras so we know um, at what stage they're at. So the pigs are informing us when we can move to the next step and the next step. Um, once they're feeding out of the bait station with the lids open, we close them halfway because that way they have to use their, their snouts, um, rostrums and tops of their heads to kind of hold those, those lids open. They get used to that very quickly. Then we close the lid with placebo bait in it. Um, they start getting used to that placebo bait and opening the lid all the way. Then we add the magnets. And now there's 30 pounds of pressure. They have to kind of pop that loose, right? It takes a little bit, but um, it's just nothing for pigs. And we know from research that we did that the biggest bass raccoon in the woods has a hard time opening a lid if it's, 30, if it's um, 23 pounds or more. So that 30 keeps the non-targets out. Um, as you can see from how the bait stations are, are designed, we put in trays of bait, we lock them in. Um, so a bait station with both of the halves together um, can hold 12, 12, 12 of those trays securely. And then what we've started to do here um, more recently due to what we're learning with our non-targets is we add a frightening device to our system so that an hour and a half before the sun comes up, this frightening device starts to go off to keep any non-targets um, away in case throughout the night pigs have spilled bait 
and then we'll arrive, clean up any spill bait, um, and have kept the non-target safe. And here's what that looks like. This is the uh, frightening device. It's just a and so we're going to be all oh, since it's a one more addition, one more thing to mess with, but it's it's cheap and it's easy to use and it seems to work really well. So some of our results uh, with our field studies with our sodium nitrite hog on bait, bait consumption is good. We're having good success with um, pigs adapting to it and consuming the bait. So importantly, our efficacy, our knockdown, and again, these kind of data are, are collected through, we do it with, with three different measures. Trail cameras, number of pigs visiting, the last night that we have placebo bait versus the night after we used a hot bait. Um, we do transects, and for most of our studies, we have a large proportion of the animals collared so that we know what percentage of them um, we visited our bait stations on the night, night that we went hot, what percentage we killed. So from um, our most recent studies with this current formulation of sodium nitrate that we're using, hog on two, we're calling it. We've done studies in Queensland, Australia, Alabama, and Texas, and we, in one night, knock those populations down 76 to 90%. So looking at tuning into the um, modeling sessions before this, this tool has potential to be a big help. It's obvious, right? And then um, our last study in Texas, which was about 14 months ago, um, before we add the frightening device, um, is when we realized that we still had an issue with some passerine birds. So that's when we did another study to add that frightening device. And with that one, during that study, we did kill 91% of the um, pigs in the area. So the addition of the frightening device did not impact our success at all because those pigs had visited the night before. Uh, what we learned from our trail cameras is by um, real early morning, um, it's the same pigs coming back for a second feeding. So they're gone by the time that uh, on a hot night, by the time that we need this frightening device to be kicking into place. So uh, we've got good success with protecting non-targets and our bait station has been working well. Like I mentioned, everybody can get into it. So we're finding all age classes um, are being contacted with the bait station. So we had those points about what makes a good um, bait station and as uh, or a good toxicant. And so this sodium nitrite hog on bait, it's, it's effective. We're able to the bait station to make it species specific, but alone it's not. Palatability is good. Very minimal risk to, um, to like scavengers. So it'd be the same, same for hunters. We can talk about that more depth if anybody likes. Um, the death, minimal pain and, and distress. I think it's an acceptable um, death antidote. We, we think that um, really not very realistic. Um, in the bait station we're, we're happy with and our time to be able to get them anim the animals onto bait regardless of it with our toxicant or a fertility control agent is, is pretty short about two weeks max so there's some um, advantages this sort of nitrate bait is it i've mentioned these um before i'll keep moving and um there's also some disadvantages that that we mentioned you know we're working toward getting it, it registered we have to be very cognizant of that, of any spillage. Um, and it's gotta be rebated daily. It's not like some of these um, baits that are starting to be talked about other um, strategies, like the kaput bait where it can gravity feed, where you could fill up a hopper and just be slowly letting the pigs eat toxic bait over time. Ours you have to rebate daily, but as you know, we only go hot for one night and have great success. So, with that, I'll wrap up and look forward to any questions and conversation then in the discussion coming up. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it's it takes a couple of minutes for the, uh, the Zoom to let me back in. Uh, thank you, Kurt. Um, so we're going to move on to our next um, presenter uh, who is uh, Matt Gentle. Matt Gentle is a principal scientist at the Pest Animal Research Center uh, Biosecurity Queensland. After undergraduate study at the University of Queensland, uh, Matthew started his career at the uh, New South Wales Vertebrate Pest Research Unit before completing his PhD on fox management with the University of Sydney. 
Since moving back to Queensland in 2004, his work has continued with the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries on investigating the ecology, impacts, and management of a range of vertebrates pests. He is currently leading research assessing the landscape management of feral cats, peri-urban wild dogs, and feral pig baiting practice. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Matt. Yeah, thanks very much, Stephanie. I'll just try and share my screen. Oops. We see it, Matt. Oh, can you see it? Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's it's actually disappeared from my screen, but I'll I'll make do. Uh, yes, yeah, so thanks very much, everyone. Um, good morning from Australia. Um, so I just thought I'd talk a bit about feral pig management and research in northeastern Australia. Uh, given it's quite a big place to try and cover, and certainly I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Peter and Cameron, their contribution. Hang on. Having trouble driving this. All right, can people see the second slide? Hopefully. Yes, we see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, so uh, in terms of feral pig distribution in Australia, they are an exotic species. They do cause lots of impacts. They're widely distributed. Uh, we think there's probably about 4 million. They vary between, say, 2.5 and, and, say, 4.5 million, according to season. Widely distributed, as I said, uh, probably two-thirds are in uh, northeastern Australia uh, in the state of Queensland where, where our work uh, focuses on. So like uh, many places worldwide, they do cause a variety of impacts, um, particularly to um, environmental uh, from predation and competition and disturbance of native species. It's not just what they consume, it's how they consume. They, they damage different environments through their feeding habits. In Australia in particular, a lot of issues that damage to agricultural commodities, uh, particularly grain, cane, fruit and vegetable crops. Uh, there is some competition for pastures uh, with grazing animals. Uh, they, they are a well-known predator of lands, up to 30% in some cases, and they do damage infrastructure such as fences and water sources. And there's always the um, pending threat of, uh, of exotic disease um, hosting and transmission as well, which we're concerned about with pigs. So I thought I'd give a bit of an overview, typically about what pig controls undertaken in Northeast Australia in particular. So a lot of it's focused on uh, poison baiting. Uh, so in the dry tropics or rangeland areas, so the dry areas of Queensland, uh, where there's typically um, meat is a, is a highly prized, high protein food source for pigs from carcasses um, and um, also preying upon live animals. Uh, meat baits are, are typically used or have been historically used uh, using sodium fluoracetate. So these are a large chunk of meat, 500 grams, injected with 72 milligrams of 1080 distributed across the landscape in key sort of areas to target pigs, particularly along river Rhine areas or water sources or key habitats for pigs. Uh, large amounts can be distributed, many hundreds of tonnes can be distributed annually, uh, particularly, as I said, in the drier, dry areas. And it's not a particularly nice job sitting in an aeroplane uh, putting out meat when it's particularly a hot, terrible job. Uh, but that can be reasonably effective uh, through biomarker trials and other assessments of ours uh, between about 63 and 70% when, when conditions are right, but it can be a lot less than that uh, when food is freely available. Uh, in the wet tropics, uh, often fruit and vegetables are used. Uh, these are particularly uh, wet environments where there's a lot of uh, production of bananas, for example, and tropical fruits. So uh, the bait types chosen are often um, used to reflect locally abundant food sources and what the pigs are actually consuming. Uh, again, sodium fluoracetate is used here, uh, injected into uh, banana and mango baits, obviously highly restricted where this can be done, lots of safety measures, but it can be highly effective with local pig populations. 
uh, and cropping areas. Um, again, we're probably heavily reliant upon sodium fluoroacetate, um, typically in, 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 in grain. Uh, it's, it's soaked grain, it's, it's dyed to uh, make sure that it's, uh, um, people are aware what the actual, uh, it is poisoned and um, there are various safety measures as well uh, in its use, but that can be highly effective, uh, particularly when uh, considerable free feeding is undertaken to reduce that neophobic uh, response. Again, can, can uh, achieve very high local reductions with, um, with grain baiting in these cropping landscapes. Um, in all environments, we certainly, um, Aware and uh, we're encouraging the use of um, of hog on the micro encapsulated sodium nitrite bait, which uh, which Kurt just introduced. So thanks very much, Kurt. Um, it can be highly effective as well. Uh, historically, it hasn't been available, but it's becoming increasingly available. And there are some other commercial baits as well. Um, Pig out is one uh, relying on 1080. So it's really it's only 1080 and so it's only in fluoracetate or or this particular bait. This is the uh, microencapsulated sodium nitride bait. Um, feral pigs are harvested both uh, recreationally and commercially in Australia. Uh, some assessments that we've undertaken suggest that it's very difficult to manage populations through harvesting alone. Harvest rates are typically 20% uh, or less, whereas really we need to get probably more than 50%. And they're very inconsistent in time and space. So, that can allow um, pig populations to escape any sort of overall harvesting effect. Uh, trapping and shooting is also widely undertaken uh, as well, uh, particularly um, in sort of key habitats um, where, where trapping is probably uh, the, the main technique that's allowable given some restrictions with uh, toxin use or shooting. Again, it can be reasonably effective. Um, aerial shooting, um, is often used and becoming increasingly used. Our landholders are aware of some of the large efforts required to actually distribute and monitor poison baits. So uh, they're often sort of chipping in with finances to uh, hire a helicopter and achieve some high local reductions very quickly. But unfortunately, most of the uh, techniques are very reactive. So people generally say um, when they consider pig numbers to be high, it's when they start um, undertaking pig control. So something we really need to try and change. Um, in terms of um, various research that we've been undertaking, just to give a bit of an overview, we have been working with landholders in particular to monitor and assess the use of uh, non-target species excluders to make sure that, as Kurt said, um, pigs can access bait or hogs can access bait and, and non-target species can't. So there are various uh, methods available ranging from the, the, uh, the bait box there to the hog hopper in the middle to uh, a bore mat it's called where uh, basically holes are dug, baits placed underneath, pigs can lift the mat, other species can't and some people even use a very simple plastic box with a weighted lid. Um, but all these techniques are highly encouraged and, we, and we're trying to basically move people across to be um, uh, to be more uh, considerate to, to non-target species in their use. Uh, and again, we're working with local governments, particularly in North Queensland, to um, encourage the use um, of non-target excluders, uh, particularly where uh, fruit baits are used and uh, there's sensitive species around. Um, in terms of some um, methods we're undertaking at the moment, so we're very much aware of the threat uh, imposed by African swine fever. Uh, it's sort of raging through Asia. It has reached um, Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, which is uh, pretty much just off the northern shore of Queensland and, and, the, and the Australian mainland. Um, so we're undertaking a number of things to try and tweak uh, pig management. One is about, we, we know our monitoring techniques for feral pigs are particularly good and, and do require improvement. Um, so we're looking at um, improving our techniques for aerial surveys of pigs. Um, given just the huge expanse of Australia and a lot of habitats we're trying to monitor, uh, it's, it is a quite a good technique. Um, we, can, we, we are using micro capture distance sampling, uh, so the technique's quite robust. Um, so it requires flying at a set height, covering a set area and recording a perpendicular distance to each animal group and we can do some modelling to look at um, uh, what proportion of groups we are actually um, counting and 
we can correct for that. So aerial surveys are really good in the more open habitats, uh, such as this in sort of um, south eastern Queensland, this is some grazing habitat. But again, when, when conditions get a bit uh, a bit denser, so woodland or the enclosed woodland, we do know we miss plenty of pig groups. So it's good to try and get an estimate of, um, of our detection probability. So we're working with um, New South Wales DPI, our colleagues from uh, the Southern State to test a, a thermal camera. Um, and that could really improve our estimate estimates uh, of pigs in, in these habitats. Uh, so we know we're not particularly good at counting pigs when they're at low densities. A number of groups are very, um, very widely distributed. And so, uh, you know, missing a couple of groups can make a big difference to our estimates so that the use of thermal imagery um, can really improve on that. So we've just completed some trials on that. Results are pending. Um, in terms of some other research we're doing uh, to try and help us um, improve our management of pigs. Um, we're working with some colleagues uh, in southern Queensland, analysing some historical data on uh, from feral pig, pigs that are GPS collared. So there's uh, about 60 pigs. Um, we're looking at some, some basic eco ecological data from that, some home range and habitat use. And that should help us inform some key areas that we can help target control. It's also particularly good for engagement and extension with land holds as well. There's often there's a lot of myths associated with where, where pigs are and what they actually undertake. Um, and, and Darren Marshall, a colleague, is certainly very aware of that. Um, and this particular example on screen, uh, many people do think that uh, feral pigs in Australia all harbour in the national parks and run out um, in the early evening into the cropping lands and grazing lands and, and munch away. But a lot of the, the data we've been seeing suggests that you know, Pigs are very, um, very sedentary, pretty much in their home range. And um, if they're in, in those cropping and grazing lands, often that's where they're living anyway. So again, a very good engagement tool to help encourage people to manage uh, pig issues on their property. Um, some other interesting things with, with the home range analysis. So obviously, if we can pick out some key areas of landscape that they are using, that can help us to target monitoring and, and control tool placements. So just, just from, a, from some of the analysis thus far, uh, we're finding that you know, most of their time is spent in a very small part of their home range. So if we can try and, um, try and determine some key habitat features um, of these particular areas, that could really help us to uh, target control. Uh, this is a map I did show earlier of, of pig distribution abundance. Um, it is pretty terrible to be truthful. It's out of date, it's quite old, it's quite coarse relying on, on estimates from, um, from experts in particular areas, um, not, particularly, not particularly good for any sort of purpose really. Um, so we're, we're trying to um, work with our, um, our, our national colleagues from the um, Commonwealth uh, Science Organisation to, to model feral pig habitat suitability in Australia and in, in Queensland in particular. Um, so this relies on looking at key features of habitats uh, which is typically um, water and food in Australia and protection from heat and protection from disturbance. Um, and with those four parameters uh, and, and, some, and some clever modelling, uh, we're looking to um, map suitable pig habitat and then translate some densities from known surveys into those habitats to help us improve our density estimates, to help us improve our distribution. And this will also ultimately help with um, using these, these uh, spatial data sets for, uh, for uh, looking at different um, strategies and scenarios with disease spread and, uh, and management modeling as well. Uh, so some recent results which, which have come through sort of this week. Uh, this is the, the current sort of um, habitat suitability um, areas in, in Queensland as, as, um, as we're provided through modeling. So looking at the key criteria, it's, it's, it's a quite strong seasonal effect. So uh, pigs uh, in Australia don't do particularly well when, when conditions are dry and it's a very uh, ephemeral continent in terms of water availability. So there's a couple of different scenarios here, like a, like a dry season and a wet season. Um, and you can see the, the potential pig habitat area um, differs remarkably uh, through those two scenarios. So it's very important to take consideration of this 
uh, through, through our management and, and modelling scenarios. Uh, thanks very much. Look, I'll, I'll leave it there, but very happy to take some questions uh, in, the, in the later session. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for either getting up very early or staying up very late. I don't know which you decided. To <laughs> I did. I did have a little sleep earlier, but okay. I'm, I'm good now. So thank you. <laughs> All right. We'll see you in the Q and A. Thanks. Um, next, we're pleased to introduce uh, Barbara Franzetti. Dr. Franzetti is a field biologist who has gained experience in ungulate uh, population conservation and management issues related to the Mediterranean and Alpine environment. She developed expertise in the application of statistical methods for population estimates, uh, in particular distance sampling, capture mark recapture, uh, camera trapping, time series, spatial analyses, population dynamics, and demographic analyses. Results of her studies have been published in peer-reviewed journals and presented at international conferences. Um, given the current spread of uh, swine fever uh, in Europe, a particular focus is now given to provide technical support to Italian authorities for wild boar management and for legislation um, in Italy. Yes. Okay, Barbara. Would you like to share your screen today? Okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I hope uh, you can see my presentation. Is it correct? Yes, we see it. Uh, oh. Okay, perfect. Um, my talk uh, will be about uh, how much uh, hard work uh, uh, it necessary uh, to get uh, reliable population estimates. Uh, well, um, much applied ecology involves counting uh, animals uh, and uh, population size uh, or density estimates are central to topics uh, ranging from conservation biology to game management, uh, to pest control and uh, um, disease control. Uh, however, evidence-based decision-making uh, in wild boar management require robust data and uh, a, a good knowledge on the population status and uh, uh, of uh, its impacts uh, on, uh, on um, the environment and uh, on the threat the population are facing. Uh, considering uh, the, the spreading of uh, ISF in Europe. Uh, however, to collect uh, reliable data, uh, we need uh, monitoring techniques that yield uh, both uh, accurate and uh, precise results, and that are sensitive even to small changes uh, in uh, uh, population size, and uh, uh, moreover, that uh, are also, that also uh, get uh, results uh, in uh, a very short time and with uh, a low uh, cost-benefit ratio. Uh, uh, it seems that uh, reaching the moon with Bezos, maybe it's cheaper, che cheaper and uh, easier in this case. Uh, however, um, uh, new technologies uh, which are becoming increasingly increasingly, uh, increasingly sorry, uh, affordable, may enable more efficient and uh, informative data collection. And uh, they bring new analysis method that can improve the way uh, uh, we handle this uh, uh, type of data collected with these new devices. Uh, distance sampling is uh, a suite of methods uh, for estimating animal abundance uh, and uh, line transit sampling has been widely used for uh, uh, monitoring uh, ungulates population. Uh, see Buckland et al and the website of uh, uh, the search group uh, to, to, for um, all the information we need on uh, this method. Um, well, uh, thermal imaging uh, 
uh, is a new, quite new brand uh, equipment that can detect uh, long wave uh, um, energy radiated by warm bodied animals, making easier the detection, uh, their detection at night. Uh, since wild boar are more active at night and prefer habitats uh, with dense ve vegetation, um, uh, um, suggest that thermal imaging can be a very useful uh, device uh, to increase uh, the probability of detecting uh, these species uh, during uh, a line transient sampling survey. As Simon said uh, before, uh, nocturnal line transient sampling uh, with thermal imaging has proven very effective uh, for estimating abundance of uh, wild boar, even under quite different uh, environmental condition. Uh, we, we use data of uh, mm, different type of uh, mm, survey uh, carried out in uh, uh, four different uh, uh, study areas, very, um, Sorry for too much different uh, um, word uh, I use in this, uh, this passage, but uh, uh, very different uh, in latitude, altitude, um, environmental characteristic habitat types and visibility. The actual density of uh, uh, the, the, the population of wild boar in this area are not known, uh, uh, despite the fact that in Castel Porziano we are uh, quite confident uh, on uh, this data, but we don't know what is going on on the other area. So we um, uh, carry out uh, a um, Uh, simulation in order to um, evaluate uh, the uh, reali reliability of uh, the estimates uh, and the precision of uh, the estimates um, yielded in the four different areas using um, uh, four type of uh, population size the one is the reference one, uh, the one uh, estimated during the study is the gray one. And uh, the other uh, three uh, population size are um, um, smaller and bigger than the one estimated. Uh, we use also, we, we simulate also uh, what uh, uh, our CV, uh, it means our precision and accurate change uh, um, using three different levels of uh, efforts, survey efforts. And what we got was that uh, um, Nocturnal uh, line transient sampling carried out in these four different study areas um, give us uh, uh, precise estimates and uh, quite accurate estimates. Uh, even if Uh, we, we, we found that uh, the different densities uh, in, the, in, in the areas uh, allow different uh, encounter rates, and so uh, this may um, impact on the size of the variance of the estimates. So uh, simply increasing the effort carry out uh, could be greatly improve both uh, precision, as you say, if I double or um, 
triple my study effort, I can get a very low precision, uh, around about 20% CV. And uh, also my uh, estimates um, reach the, 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 uh, the target uh, one. Uh, however, uh, to, to get precise and accurate estimate, you have to um, meet all the assumptions of the method. Uh, and this is quite difficult because uh, uh, usually people say that uh, um, uh, meeting, um, getting uh, a, a probability of detection of one on the transect, uh, especially if you do it uh, on foot, uh, uh, could be difficult because you uh, move the animals uh, and uh, in some way you uh, um, decrease your detection probability. Anyway, we say that uh, uh, using this new device, uh, uh, new thermal imager, new thermal imager uh, may help in what working during night may help uh, for sure in getting uh, much more uh, observation um, respecting the assumption to um, see the animals on the transects, uh, limiting um, any type of uh, disturbed to animals uh, and so uh, in, uh, in, in a certain way to to try to do the best to respect the assumption of the, uh, this method. Uh, a problem remain with, uh, um, how can I say, uh, uh, what is conventionally say uh, called uh, convenient samplings. I mean, uh, a non-random uh, placement of transect in a study area because working at night uh, is difficult I mean, you have uh, security issues uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, necessary uh, to, to reduce this disturbing the animals. So um, this could be uh, the, the main source of bias uh, in this type of survey because uh, uh, it may lead to a non-uniform distribution of animals with respect to the transit because Anyway, animals avoid transect or uh, select the area around it. So you, you may uh, contact less wild boar or more wild boars uh, than uh, expected. Um, so uh, despite sampling on foot, uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, uh, allow um, a better even coverage uh, of the study area uh, and the habitat types uh, available in the study area uh, then uh, sampling by, um, from a car um, an additional effort should always be made to verify the distribution of animals with respect to the transit line uh, placement. And this is means uh, more time, more money, uh, more effort, uh, more personnel to, to try to uh, understand if uh, uh, what the, uh, the way in which we are monitoring animals uh, is uh, uh, a good way and we respect all the assumptions so that uh, our results can be considered reliable. Uh, another um, population, uh, another uh, popular um, device, uh, especially in the last 10 years, uh, is uh, um, the camera trap. Um, camera traps uh, are uh, a new monitoring uh, solution that are becoming 
really extremely popular uh, to monitor elusive and uh, nocturnal species. Uh, these devices uh, are popular because they allow to collect uh, a large number of, uh, uh, a large amount of observation and uh, they bring together um, new uh, statistical method, new uh, statistical uh, analysis technique to handle uh, this uh, type of data. So um, they seem promising, but uh, uh, there are uh, still few, really few uh, studies that uh, evaluate the, the real reliability of the results uh, uh, obtained with this uh, uh, estimation methods. Uh, we uh, we use uh, um, a model to uh, reproduce the movement uh, uh, inside uh, of an animal inside uh, uh, its home range, um, accounting for uh, um, three different type of behavior characterized by three different type of speed, uh, resting, uh, feeding, uh, at Low, uh, low speed and movement at fast speed. And uh, we simulate uh, the different uh, camera trap surveys uh, to evaluate the uh, reliability of uh, population estimate obtained with the, these four main uh, models uh, that use uh, data obtained with camera traps. Uh, and uh, as you can see, results uh, uh, show that uh, uh, the REM model and the WTE model uh, seems to uh, be uh, more accurate and precise than uh, AM and uh, uh, RES model. Um, in particular, we can say that uh, if we uh, make a very big effort and we have a, a high density population, as you can see, uh, the double TE model seems to be the more um, efficient in uh, uh, representing uh, the real uh, population uh, size uh, uh, of the area. Uh, in, in this case, if we uh, improving uh, the, the, the effort, uh, increasing the effort uh, in area where uh, we have uh, many uh, animals uh, could uh, um, uh, result in having uh, good results uh, also by um, RES model. Anyway, some warnings about uh, this. Uh, also, uh, camera traps uh, um, monitoring methods, uh, uh, type of surveys, uh, as whatever you call it, uh, need to respect uh, a lot of assumption, uh, in particular, uh, in order to uh, uh, obviously uh, to to, the, to get uh, reliable results, because this is the aim. Uh, and in particular, uh, we we uh, we would like to underline that it's necessary to pay attention um, on estimating correctly camera traps parameters. A lot of uh, uh, studies doesn't say anything about uh, measuring the detection uh, distance at each uh, camera site uh, and uh, the real field of view uh, of uh, the camera trap at that site. Um, the second one is uh, uh, choosing a correct design. A lot of camera trap uh, 
surveys are uh, carried out using uh, um, uh, convenience sampling, uh, just because uh, maybe the objective is uh, uh, to, to increase the number of observations, but uh, you can't use them to estimate population size. Uh, another question is related to uh, the, the measuring of speed of the animals. Some of these methods require uh, to measure correctly the speed of the animals, and this is really, really an issue uh, if you want to carry out a good uh, monitoring of your population. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Our final presenter today is Julia Coates. Julia Coates is a field ecologist based at the National Wildlife Management Center, which is part of the Animal and Plant Health Agency in York, UK. Um, Julia has been working on monitoring population size and behavioral uh, behavior of several native and non-native wildlife species in the UK and overseas. Her current main research interests focus on developing species uh, specific systems to deliver baits to wildlife such as wild boar and non-native gray squirrels. Julia has co-authored 15 peer reviews on wildlife management and behavior. So Julia, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've been experiencing some problems with the sound, so hopefully uh, you'll all be able to see me even if you can't uh, hear me, even if you can't see me. Is you that sound correct? great. You actually sound okay. perfectly clear. You're good. Okay, great. Well, he hello, everybody. Uh, my presentation today is about work uh, we did to develop a device to deliver bait to wild boar. Uh, this was in the context of a study to assess whether if we developed a bait delivered contraceptive uh, wild boar uh, to wild boar, uh, we could target this species. Uh, next slide, please. So we started by listing all the features of an ideal bait delivery system. Uh, we believe that such a system should be species specific, make bait accessible to groups of animals, hard wearing, as they'll probably use it as a, a scratch in post. Move and relatively Uh, next slide, please. Created the Bohr Operated System, or BOSS. Instead of describing it later on in the presentation, um, in Essex, the boss exploits the natural behavior of the boar to use the snout. Julia, your, um, your sound may be cutting in and out. I'm sorry. Hello. Uh, we can hear you now. Hello, can anybody hear me? We can hear you now. Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Yeah, we're sort of only hearing every other sentence uh, that Julia is saying at this point. Right. Julia, do you want to give it one more try? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it still appears to be cutting in and out. Yeah, I think we're really having an audio uh, problem with Julia. 
Um, is Giovanna available, perhaps? Uh, I I am. Do you want me to continue? If you can, that would be excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I can because I I'm so I'm sorry that yeah we, we've had to, sometimes I couldn't hear or oh, I could hear on and off some of the speakers so hopefully can, can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'll continue. Ju Julia's talk. Um, okay, so we started with captivity trials. Um, we tested the BOS, the Bohr operated system, in captivity at the lab in York. And then because it was successful, we moved to field trials in the UK, in the US, in Italy, and in Montserrat, in the Caribbean. And we were essentially doing these trials to confirm the effectiveness to monitor beta uptake by known target species. Next one, please. So this is how the BOSS works. Um, and uh, wild boar generally are not yellow on the, the, the top of the head. They're yellow because we put a marker there. So soon you will see another animal that comes. She's yellow too because she has already used the boss. Um, it's very easy to, to find and use for the wild boar. Very similar to, to the concept that Kurt was talking about before. Everybody can feed from it. Uh, it's heavy. so no other animals we know of apart from the bear can uh, feed from it. And we'll have some slides soon about uh, the non-target species. We were using bait like um, maize to um, check that all the boar could, could feed from it. There was no contraceptive there. It was just as a, as a trial. And we tested it in different combinations uh, and in different clusters of boss in uh, different parts of the world. Next slide, please. So the wild boar fed from the boss um, very happily in whatever situation it was offered, uh, the, the bait was offered to them and several animals piglets and old could feed from it, both in captivity and in the wild. Next one, please. We had many non-target species trying to feed from it because they could uh, smell, obviously not the birds, uh, they could smell the, the bait because the base is perforated. Uh, and in particular, we're very worried about the badgers, the European badgers, because they're protected by law in, in the UK. They have a special law that protects the European badger and they're strong enough to lift the cone if they want to, but they don't seem to have the, the behavior to do so. So sometimes we had uh, clusters of very desperate badgers trying to feed from it and we're not able to. Next one, please. So in Montserrat with feral pigs, again, matter of a couple of days and they could find the, so these are uh, free living animals and they could find uh, the boss and feed from it. In the States, uh, I believe this is in Florida, that the bear uh, could, was the only species that could feed from it. And we said, okay, no worry, we will call it the bear operated system. And the bottom one is in Italy. Uh, porcupines were again, trying to feed from it uh, at some point, we had five porcupines around the boss, but none, nobody could feed from it. Next one, please. So our conclusions was that the, the boss met most of the criteria, maybe all the criteria that we set out to, to prove to start with. So it's speech specific. It makes bait accessible to groups. It is hard wearing. We had occasionally uh, instances that where wild boar were using it as a scratching point, but it wasn't damaged. It's about 17 kilos. It could be made lighter if we want to. Um, and obviously it will depend on economy of scale on how expensive it is. It's easy to deploy and to assemble and to move. And uh, it was about, it would be 300 US dollar per um, boss. 
but again, these were prototypes. So it would the, the cost if it was mass produced was would be much, much lower. We believe that the boss or similar uh, devices could be used to deliver baits to wild boar and wild pigs that eventually will contain um, contraceptives because the other work on delivering uh, vaccines against classical swine fever have demonstrated that you can reach a very high proportion of the population. And I believe this is the last slide. Maybe there's another one just to say thank you to everybody for listening to this. Thank you. And I hope Julia is around to answer questions. If not, I'll answer them. Okay, so I know that um, we're running just a couple of minutes late. We are going to go ahead and proceed with the Q&A. Um, and if anybody can't continue to, to stay and join us for the Q&A, no sweat. Again, we are recording this. So if you have to jump off, uh, you'll have access to the, entire, uh, the entirety of both sessions. And uh, you can go back and watch the Q&A at your leisure. But with that, I'm going to start um, with our first question that came in. Um, and this one, if Kurt is still around, this one's for you. Um, uh, the questionnaire said, a great summary. Assuming that science gives us an oral contraceptive that meets your stated criteria for a good bait, would there be any difficulty to offer a contraceptive in place of a toxicant like the hog on bait? And then the second question is, and would there have to be any revisions to the logistics of providing the contraceptive, which is different from the, the hog on bait? Right. Um, yeah, two good questions. And as I stated, surely, you know, part of our big picture plan is to, to make a box that could be useful for any kind of pharmaceutical agent. So, you know, we have in our heads besides um, fertility control agents and, and our toxicant that um, we're developing for, you know, with the focus right now would be like vaccines too. It could be used for bovine tuberculosis vaccine in some areas where that's an issue. Maybe it could be used for an ASF um, vaccine like Giovanna um, just mentioned. So, so yeah, that's part of the of our big picture. And then would revisions be required? And it would depend on the characteristics of the contraceptive, right? If it's a one-time feed, just like right now, we can put this out in an area and contact 90% of the pigs um, with whatever's in it in one night. If it's a one and done, so that's gotta be the goal, right? That's the ultimate contraceptive. Permanent right. sterilization after one dose would be mm -hmm. the goal. You could follow what we're doing right now. If, um, if it requires a booster, you, you might be able to go into an area, essentially um, contracept the vast majority of the pigs in an area, move on to the next area, the next area, and then circle back in six months or two years, whenever you need that, that booster. Right. It's a continuous feed, which I believe we talked about some other product last week, some that was like a continuous feed. I think that from the modeling talks we heard earlier, it's, it's not realistic, why bother? Um, so it would kind of depend, but on, on the, we'd have to care, we'd have to um, fit it to, Characteristics of the contraceptive, but yeah, I think there's great potential to to use these methods to get pigs on bait, to gather them, to get them on bait, and to get a dose into them. Right. Definitely. Yeah. And then, and don't go anywhere because I think we have another uh, another couple of questions for you. These came in uh, as, as soon as your your talk uh, was completed, so hang on. Uh, so, Kurt. Uh, do you have problems with animal welfare issues given that hypoxia uh, takes um, up to three hours? So I guess maybe um, describing what the actual mode of death is and any animal welfare concerns that, that may arise as a result. Right, we, we looked at this to um, get an idea because it's important to, to us, the USDA, to have as peaceful of a death um, as, as we can. So we did, a, you know, the nasty study to, to watch. Um, and after they ingest the bait, usually you can start to see some effects that they aren't feeling well. They're starting to feel the um, 
the hypoxia kicking in within a half hour, an hour or so. And they'll, they'll start to get maybe a little uncoordinated and kind of wobbly. And this is a pen study, so we could watch every movement, right? And they would go off and just lay down and kind of doze off, even slip in, it appears like slip into a, a coma. So yes, yeah, three hours to death but to being, to reacting, to looking like they're um, feeling anything is, is shorter than that. There was in some animals, like they, um, like, like a dog falling asleep on their side and kind of paddling. There was, there was some of that, um, but it wasn't enough to, to look that bad to us. We published it and put it out for public comment um, and it seems to be an acceptable death. Okay. Um, and then what about toxicity to humans? And this is my question. I, that was one of the ones I wrote down while you were speaking. You know, um, uh, are there any concerns and are, are there recommendations when handling it on uh, preventing human exposure to it by just touching it with your hands when you're, when you're placing it in the bait stations? Right. Our label will say to, to wear gloves um, mm -hmm. and long sleeves, but no, it's an ingestion that would be the, the danger. Mm -hmm. So the way that it's coming packaged in those little trays with the um, cellophane top, right. we just rip that top off, set it into the base station, put the, we kind of lock it in. There's a, a jig there to, to lock it in with. So there really isn't much contact um, with it. And so okay. that was a consideration as we made it such a easy to use system. Okay. Um, I think this one is for you as well, but um, um, the question is, and then this actually may be for Matt, uh, pick of the harvest, what do the, what, what are the carcasses for consuming or something else like, are, are they actually used? I, I think what they're asking is, are they actually used um, and, or are they simply disposed of? No, look, that, that's a really good question. Um, yeah. yeah, so in Australia, we have, we have a game meat harvesting uh, industry and uh, feral pigs are harvested uh, commercially and um, mainly uh, exported to Europe uh, for human consumption. Um, and, th and that's what those particular carcasses were for in the, in the photo. Uh, there is a recreational sort of harvesting and hunting industry as well. Uh, there's not a lot of domestic consumption of, of, of uh, feral pig. It's, it's not a particularly sort of uh, liked um, game meat in Australia, but certainly a lot of it is exported, um, particularly to Europe uh, for, hu for human consumption. Okay, and then how about the average distance of movement? Um, just generally, um, I think is what they're referring to. Uh, do these animals, if they're in um, a group, uh, are they moving a lot or does that really depend on the resources available to them? and they're just individual spatial use given where they're, they are located. Yeah, look, it, it is really hard to generalize given, uh, you know, they have a lot of sort of individual behaviors, of course, but um, on average, the males are moving about five kilometers a day. I think it's slightly less than five, 4.9 kilometers a day. And the females are moving about 3.9. So uh, that, that's potentially useful information that we can, we can sort of use to, um, to, to look at spacing of monitoring techniques, for example. Oh, it's a cat. Yeah, hello, this is Monkey. Um, <laughs> let's see, uh, and then how can you combine the predict model for pig um, with their density? Um, I hope yeah, I'm yes. asking the question correct. No, yeah. no that's, that's another really good question. So um, obviously we'll, we'll have, have our model of uh, feral pig uh, habitats, uh, suitable habitats. And um, in, in Queensland and other states of Australia each year, there's often a lot of um, aerial surveys undertaken for, for macropods, so, so for kangaroos, mm -hmm. uh, and, and pigs are often counted as part of that. Uh, some recent technologies allowing us to um, spatially georeference each sighting that is uh, recorded on those surveys. Uh, so historically, we've just used data recorders. So we record when we see a, see a pig group and how far it is from the helicopter to allow us to do distance sampling. Now we're using uh, some, some data loggers that allows us to log as soon as you see the animal group, and that allows us to uh, record a spatial location. So over time, we'll have a good 
data set in terms of uh, where animal groups are seen, what habitats, uh, and, and from what survey. Um, and historically as well, we've got some quite good historical data. There's at least 140 odd um, density estimates of, of pigs, like robust density estimates of pigs, uh, generally through aerial surveys or other, other ground-based techniques that, we, that are, are quite robust, uh, that we can use to help refine uh, which particular habitats um, have higher densities and, and lower densities. So, so we can do some, some modelling of that. Um, there will be some uh, there will be some confidence intervals around that, of course, but it's it's a good start to understand um, densities of pigs in certain habitats. Okay. Yeah. And then a couple of questions for both, uh, one more question for Kurt and Matt. Have there been any social science studies conducted related to hog on that look at social acceptability of using this kind of toxicant? Matt, maybe I'll start. Yeah, it sounds good, Kurt. Thank you. Yeah, hey, it's, it's good to see you, by the way. Same, same. <laughs> um, so, Brooke, where the hell were you last week? You must have been out chasing polar bears or chasing pigs in Saskatchewan. <laughs> there were some really good talks um, about on just this topic. So, they mentioned that these talks are, we can go back and, and view them. So, Ryan, check out Keith Carlisle's talk. He's done really nice work. And, and why I'm so excited about it is because he had something like 30,000 respondents. You know, he great um, respondents on surveys, which which tells you that alone tells you that there's real interest in this. Yeah. So um, yeah, Keith Carlisle, who's part of Stephanie Swiss group at NWRC, um, working with others too. They've, they've done these surveys in multiple states, we're working with Texas. Um, so there's been some good work done on that. And then in Matt's shop, you've got Darren Marshall. Um, so I'll hand it to Matt to talk about some of the work that Darren's done. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. Yes, so we have um, we have Darren Marshall who's doing his his doctorate, uh, looking at um, uh, engaging the community through through feral pig research. A lot of that is involving um, like social science studies, I guess you could say, about uh, how acceptable uh, certain uh, certain techniques are. Um, and, and how effective you know, pig control is in general. Um, but yeah, certainly there's some other work being undertaken as well in our part of the world, um, getting a bit of an understanding about, uh, how, about how practitioners feel about certain, um, certain control techniques, how acceptable or unacceptable uh, things are viewed. And, uh, and as Kurt said, it's always really important to, um, to, to work towards in, in improving any control technique as, as best as we can. So that, that's what we're certainly encouraging, um, the use of more, more humane techniques where, where possible, um, and certainly sodium nitrites leading the way in terms of oxygen there, so. And then um, I believe this may be the final question for today, and anyone can jump in and uh, answer this one because it wasn't directed toward anybody in particular. Um, is there any experience uh, in reducing crop damage with non-lethal toxicants, i.e. Um, conditioning via nausea or vomit reflex? If so, how efficient was it? Anybody have any experience with that or know somebody that does? Um, yeah. Stephanie? Yes. So I, I worked before working with, in, in between working with wild boar, um, I worked with condition taste aversion and uh, on several wildlife species. And we came to the conclusion that others have found before that if an animal has already tasted something that they like and they have learned it's safe, they will not unlearn it. So even if you make them ill on that and nauseous, it, it would be very, very difficult to convince them otherwise. And I'm not aware of any other study that has tried this on pigs of wild boar. Right. Yeah, the only one that I'm familiar with, a couple of studies are on Canada geese, uh, a taste aversion product on Canada geese here in the US. And then uh, I think some taste aversion um, studies that have been done with coyotes uh, in the US. So not aware myself of any um, studies with wild pigs yet. 
Okay, um, I think that concludes our uh, Q&A session for today. Thank you for all of you that uh, stayed and uh, um, because we did go a little bit over with our presentations, they were all outstanding. So with that, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Monique so she can, she can wrap it up. Yep, I'd like to just thank everyone, of course. Um, and if you do have questions after um, the webinar ends, you can email them to the Botsdeeper Institute and we can try to get them answered for you. Um, that would be biwfc at botsdeeper.org. And next week, same time, Thursday, uh, the 24th is day three of this series, the final day of the series. And the topics will be research and development of fertility control. So uh, we hope you all join us for that. And again, um, if, oh, you need, if you need the link or you wanna share the link with someone and you don't have that, you can also contact Botsdeeper Institute for the link to that day three event. Um, with that, just thank you everyone for being here and for participating. Yeah, the presentations were excellent, thank you. Okay, we'll conclude the webinar. Take care, Take care everyone. everyone.